ever imagine all life as you know it stopping instantaneously and every molecule in your body exploding at the speed of light. Total Protonic Reversal. Protonic Reversal. Protonic Reversal with your host, Conan Neutron. Broadcasting from a secret underground lair in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. A gigantic middle finger to everything that is rock about music, rock and roll, and corporate power. The thing is, though... If you don't laugh, you're going to go on a killing spree with shop and nails. Hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it. Confidence of a hero or a fool, I wasn't exactly certain which. Could not be more professional. It's all That's like a science thing, right? Indeed, indeed, indeed. <laughs> yes, it's a science thing. It's a science place. It is a scientific fact. We are all up in your face. It is time for the one, the only. Protonic reversal. Special stay at home late night edition. At least for everyone on the East Coast or Central Time. Uh, not that late for the West Coast, but, you know, we'll take it. Hey, welcome. Why am I doing this? I'm trying to do, like, the sultry voice right now. I don't know why I'm doing doing the sultry voice, but got a great guest for you tonight, Mario Rubacaba. He's a, God, busy dude. Busy, busy dude. I mean, rocking from the crypt, hot snakes. Off, click a tad at Not to mention Earthless. Goddamn Earthless. Who are great. If you ever have a chance to see Earthless, you absolutely need to see them. Uh, they're 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 a band that I think even fans of uh, people that are not fans of long song bands can get behind Earthless. That that's my uh, that's my take on it. Pretty fascinating stuff. Anyway, looking forward to talking to him. And yeah, I guess that's it. I guess that's the send tweet. <laughs> <laughs> what else? What's el- what else is going on? Um, thanks everyone for sharing the show around. Remember, uh, f- the feed's always free, always, hundred percent of the time. You can subscribe anywhere you get your podcast at RadioNeutron.com. If you want to join the Patreon, it's uh, Patreon.com slash Reversal. Dollar a month gets you the the shows quicker. That's it. You get them quicker. So if that's something that's of interest to you, check it out. Dive in. Otherwise... You'll still get them. We got like a 10 episode backlog right now. Well, it's nine, but it's going to be 10 after this. So I think we just now released the Jerry Casale episode to the, to the masses. So that's that. Thanks for all the feedback. I used to get pissed at shows that would do this. Where it's like, yeah, yeah, we get it. But what am I going to do? Talk about like what I do with my day? Same thing I did yesterday. <laughs> uh, yeah. Anyway, so let's have a. Oh God. Let's let's listen to. <laughs> let's listen to some of an Earthless track, and I say some because at some point I actually do want to talk to Mario. Uh, so this is uh, from the ages of the 2018 album by Earthless. And we're going to listen to, oh, let's start with the first one, Violence of the Red Sea. Strap in. Protonic Reversal.
That's right, folks. That is Violence of the Red Sea. And with us now, there was no way to do that smoothly. Sorry about that. (laughs) 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 You know what? It's like I've been doing this for a while, but I was like, there's no way I can. I I can't just like, oh, yeah, it totally does that in the song. No, it doesn't freaking do that, man. (laughs) And with us now now is the man, the myth, the legend, Mario Rupakawa. Welcome. Welcome to the show, dude. Thanks for having me. Yeah. uh, I'm a big Earthless fan, but what I neglected to think about because to me they're normally a, a throw the album on like rock out kind of situations like christ these songs are all really long and i i, I didn't i did not think about it but it's great because what when you when you're playing it you don't it, they don't feel like long songs like some some bands i'll play a long song and you're like you're feeling every second of it and you're like oh christ we get it sonic explorations but you know i, I think you guys do a really good <laughs> job of it and it's that's a that's a hard line to thread uh thanks so, man when you originally were, when you came up with the idea f- for Earthless, was that like the conceit of it originally, or just sort of end up being that way? It. Um, let me think back, because man, I was just uh, thinking we've been a band for like almost twenty years 20, now, eighteen years or something, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So um, going back to like the first couple of practices or jams or whatever when we when we started playing. Yeah, they're called um, jams, sir. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I really, I think the first. The first time we ever really explored explored you know that kind of territory was um, the first time we were playing and uh, we were doing a couple covers and it was I, I was a, like a Zeppelin and like Sabbath cover that merged together and it was the in between part that was like twenty five to thirty minutes long that was just all like imp- <laughs> improvised stuff right right just go so, just just like going for it yeah. Yeah, so, you know, in between that 25 and 30 minutes, there was all these little songs that just happened on the spot, like fucking telepathy, sorry, um, you know, it was like magic, and so we are kind of like after that, looking at each other like, whoa, okay, that that was like half an hour ago, so, um, yeah, that's sort of where it started. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're not just digging deep, we have a full-on trench going here, guys, let's keep going. Right. <laughs> And so um, within, you know, the next few times of playing, we, we would try like, you know, coming up with a couple of riffs, I think, you know, like Isaiah would have a couple of things here and there and, and they just, it didn't feel right at the moment. And then we would just start playing on a, on a whim. And for some reason that just kind of felt like the right thing to do. It just felt natural. I mean, yeah. Yeah. It, like I said, it's, it's, uh, you know, especially for, for my taste, like a lot of, a lot of bands that will try to do that. Like, it's, just, it's. It doesn't work for me, but I think you guys rule it. Like it's 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 it hits differently somehow, and I think <clears throat> I, I can't exactly define it, and I wouldn't necessarily want to, but I think it really works, and it makes it a very compelling show uh, when you guys play it too. Like I mean, the records are great, but like when you guys are like, it seems like you, it seems like you you three are like just thrilled to be doing it too, which always is nice. Like it's yeah it, yeah. There's there's a like what they say, a cont- contagious enthusiasm. Just yeah, to come from an earthless show. For for me personally, as a drummer, it's it's probably it's such a a different palette of exploring and playing and stuff. I could just kind of do whatever I want. Oh, it's you're not shredding, like, yeah, you know. Dude. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> but I mean, but I mean, but I mean, in the context of like, okay, like when I play with Rock from the Crypt, it's like you know, there's a set list yeah. of like the same twenty songs every set, and which is cool, and they're and that's fun, but like there's not too much movement in, or change within the songs, you know, every Earthless show is different every night. Like, yeah. There's no like script, you know? So, and, and that kind of blew my mind the first time I saw you that like, you know, a friend of mine was like, Oh yeah, they, it's, <clears throat> it's like a different set every night. I'm like, like say what? <laughs> like, yeah. Crazy. Like that's like Miles Davis stuff. Like in, in a way. Yeah. Was, was that ever like, in, I mean, you said it sort of just came extemporaneously, but did, did that ever come as like a, like a, a you know a hallmark or signifier of like hey what if we did like our thing but like a jazz band or something along those lines like you know what i mean where it would hit maybe some of the same notes here and there but wouldn't always be the same thing like you know a rock band a rock set etc cetera, etc cetera. because that's that's kind of hard to pull off i mean i can think i can think of bands like fugazi that would you know, they change at the set every night based on you know certain signifiers and things along those lines. But what you guys yeah. do is like fairly unique that I that I can think of. Yeah, I mean, like as far as being in the jazz, you know, Mike and I, the bass player, and myself, we're we're into jazz. But like, 
we I think we're coming from more of a kraut rock and sort of like totally a lot of those influences well, at least when we started but but the thing that I think kind of makes us what helps us stand out is is more like having the maybe the punk background or having yeah. uh, you know like like we like all three of us like that kind of stuff like you know any of the bands that we've toured with throughout the years if we you know if we had to share a van or like one of those things like they would like and they're playing kind of like stoner rock music or psychedelic music that like i don't i can't really think of one of them that was ever into like void or like dc hardcore yeah or, yeah, like, yeah yeah you know we'd play them we'd play them chrome and they'd be like what the you know what is this this is like you know we're like oh like, like we're into like chrome and birthday party and like void and yeah, yeah. so those those kind of like influences sort of seep into having that kind of a um, background with with like an s stuff so well yeah i mean it hits differently right yeah I mean, <clears throat> as most stuff that kind of comes from punk rock does it's you know yeah. when, when there's stuff that's kind of kraut rock it's like oh yeah it's no way but if no way was into muscle cars you know like <laughs> yeah <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> in a good way, and and I think that that's you know there's not. I hate to say it, but like you know the the quote unquote stoner rock genre as well as like psychedelia in general just tends to be kind of uniform, and they're like, oh, I I can probably guess what your favorite records are, you know. You just, I, yeah, you not know. to be a dick about it because I love some of those records no. too, but you know. No, me too. Okay. But, but I mean, you know, you throughout the years of doing this and stuff, you meet certain bands where it's like okay they only listen to that kind of genre you know prog rock and, and psychedelic rock or hard rock stuff and, and that's kind of like their main focus yeah they which like that's, weed. that's fine yeah <laughs> not, that's totally cool we get you know, it you guys like it. weed <laughs> <laughs> they're they're inspired <laughs> but yeah, exactly. um we have a pretty pretty varied palette so between the three of us you know we're just pretty out there so so you you <clears> you, <throat> you first started playing with uh with mike and isaiah that was like right when you moved back to san diego to join rocket right it was like right around the same time yeah yeah period. Like, i literally just moved back to san diego and uh it was within the first two months probably so yeah it was kind of an unexpected thing because i had moved um i was i moved back to the same town that mike lived in and uh we, you know, we knew each other from back in the day, but we were we never really hung out in the same circles. He's a, little, a couple years younger than I am, but um, forget how we we probably saw each other at the record store and just kind of started talking from there, you know, and sure, just yeah. uh, hung out, got a burrito or something like that, and kind of just does. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, ca- catching up on on record collections, and from there that was when we kind of like really connected on some of the really uh, defined influences <laughs> right so you were coming you were coming from uh were you in chicago uh at that point yeah that with the, yeah you playing with jacks and uh bill skibby yeah we yeah i jammed with those guys for a couple of years well with bill and jessica um we we didn't have a band name for the whole time i lived there we just played music a couple times a week yeah. and then uh when i told them i was moving we we're like oh man we better we better try and do something with these loose <laughs> sketches that we have you know yeah yeah and, yeah and that ended up being called uh, Sea of Tombs, so, um, which is kind of in a weird way a precursor to what Earthless does, because but in a little bit more primitive punk, I would say, edge to it. Like they're all instrumental songs, uh, a little bit more garagey sounding, but um, but still kind of fuzzed out, psychedelic and pretty raw. But um, but yeah, but it was a kind of a little, you know, preview of what would happen with earthless a year later right right so. And, and so and i'm trying not to <clears throat> screw up the timeline too much here but bef- before that was thingy right or uh, or was metro Cipher before that i'm trying to, <laughs> I'm trying to uh same here <laughs> <laughs> um Man, and and, I, and the reason why I bring up Metro Shifter specifically is not just because I'm interested in hearing in hearing about that, but there's a good Louisville contingent who uh, listens to the show. So yeah, yeah, you out. know, I think I think Metro Shifter was more mid, like '90s, like n- maybe like '96. I'm gonna say like, so. So post Click Attack, but pre Chicago. Yeah, even maybe at the end of like Click Attack era, and then uh, Thingy was definitely um, post Click Attack. And, um, yeah, that was around 97, I think, thing he was, if I'm not, I don't know. But, um, but yeah, Metro Shifter was kind of a weird uh, on and off thing, um, uh, which started from uh, 
probably had roots in meeting Scott from like 91, like on my first first band that ever toured, uh, this band called 411. So uh, we played with Scott's band, this band called Sunspring. Um, I think we played one or two shows with them and stayed at the same houses, you know, after the show. And um, so I, I connected with him. And then also the first show that 411 played in Louisville, it was, that's kind of changed my life if I really think about it. Cause like it was after the show, I went and hung out with like the dudes from Endpoint and like this whole scene. It was like 50 people at like Chad from End- Endpoint's house or apartment and they were just going crazy. Like kids skating everywhere and like right. just, <laughs> just causing havoc. Like I've never seen, it was so fun. It was like, I was laughing the whole time. These people were such like characters and, uh, but then they're playing really good music and, and every, I kept asking like, Oh, what's this? Like, what's that? What's this? And it was, you know, all local Louisville bands. And, um, Man, I think that's where, yeah, that's where I heard Slint for the first time. And I kept asking over and over. I'm like, what's this? And I'm like, man, it's Slint, man. <laughs> and, um, How you not yeah, know so, Slint? <laughs> yeah, before that, I think Spiderland had just come out. So uh, yeah, yeah. that was like, like totally hit me over the head, like really heavy. And uh, yeah, from there, I kept in touch with those guys. And, and they turned me on to like so much music from Louisville, which was like a really, really big influence on kind of just other bands that I ended up getting getting into through friends from Louisville or even just like Slint alone, like totally influenced my drum playing. Like Britt from sure, Slint is like yeah. one of my favorite drummers. And Dude, monster player. And like such a unique yeah. voice too. Like it's it's real, this, the the phrasing and the way he would do stuff is just real, real interesting. I mean, even if you're yeah, yeah. predominantly a drummer, it's still like, it catches the ear. Yeah. Totally, yeah. Did, didn't so. Scott like, didn't he like, run for office or something at some point like you know, I, man, like the set like i i seem to remember something about this got from a- yeah yeah i ended up hearing about that too we we weren't i think we kind of fell out of touch by that point but um but yeah i i heard heard that and then last i heard he was living in sweden so <laughs> <laughs> it's been you a know, while man for office for a while what is he forrest gump <laughs> jesus i mean <laughs> all respect yeah uh yeah, yeah, okay. So Metro Shifter, you know, so Metro Shifter and Thingy, very different sort of bands. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> very yeah. different from Click Attack. I don't, I don't know from Four One One, but I mean, where I'm driving at is that that a lot of these bands, like they're, I mean, the correlating factors are all really cool, but they're, they're very different styles, they're different feels, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you know, Thingy, it's like the songs are like hardcore length, but they're these like little, like crazy, like super like bite sized pieces of pop almost, uh, played aggressively, which, yeah, I, which yeah. I was really appreciated. Although well, the first time, the first time I heard it really confused me. Cause I was like, what though? What am I listening? What is this? Is this, was this, is this like the same song? <laughs> and I was like, Oh no, these are all different songs. Okay, cool. Right. There's probably like 27 songs on the first CD. Right. And it was, you know, it was pretty, yeah. Cause it, that was like really, Man, I'm trying to think back. Um, uh, it was, was a like really short list. Yeah, well, yeah, but it wasn't wasn't for wasn't for long, right? It was like, like, oh, I was only in the band maybe like five months, I think, maybe four months, and I did two records in four months. Jesus <laughs> Christ, man! <laughs> but wow. Rob, Rob's a workhorse. He's like yeah. a dictionary of of songs and songwriting. He, you know, probably he's just he can come up with a song and like, you know, just on the spot, and it's like a little technical pop like you said pop punk you know uh progressive techno fucking yeah just medley and it's like a minute and 30 seconds long dude i once saw <laughs> rob crow do uh he, on this one tour he did he called it dev fits where he did devo songs in the style of the misfits and misfit songs in the style of devo and it was just him and it was oh, crazy awesome like it was <laughs> and i was <laughs> and i was like how long have you been doing this like oh i just made it for this tour i'm like are you of course you did of course yeah yeah it's his style <laughs> that's that's rob, that's rob crow for you yeah uh so wow so four months all right so that that's a that's a pretty <laughs> productive four months jesus christ <laughs> yeah well we did the the first record we did that really fast maybe like a month and we played a we played like a handful of shows maybe in the like month or two months um and then, uh, oh, this is, it was right before I was leaving to, to move to Chicago. That's what it was. So I told him I was moving. That's a, the and song's so, about angels, evil, and some other <laughs> stuff that I can't remember. Yeah. yeah. 
So after I told him I was moving in about a month, he squeezed in and wrote probably, that's when you probably wrote the, the second record. <laughs> oh, hey, real quick, I wrote another record. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, so then, uh, and you're in, in you go to Chicago, you're playing with Bill, and uh, for, for the other band that we mentioned, then, so what happens? Like, uh, John Reese gives you the call and was like, Hey man, we need to come back, come down to San Diego and play in Rocket. Like, what is that? What is that? I, I imagine it being somewhat like you know how they have it in movies where you know you get the call. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Was it was it like wasn't, that? No, it wasn't Damn. quite like that actually. Um, Damn. Not as not as glamorous. Um, maybe a little bit more kind of by accident, I guess. Um, so through my playing with Paul Jenkins from Blackheart Procession. Blackheart Procession who I completely so to that, when I was mentioning that era, yeah. So that was in that same little timeline as well, right when I moved to Chicago. And kind of off and on, when I was living there, I would come back and play with those guys every now and then. Um, I think I was visiting back in San Diego and hanging with Paul. And um, oh, we cruised over to Andy, that uh, rocket guitarist, and um, to where he lived, which was kind of just a party plays people played music there and stuff and um and he told me that rocket had been looking for a drummer for like a year at that point and um so i was like oh really i didn't you know i didn't even know that adam had quit so um i kind of it kind of just i never thought i would play drums in rocket from the crypt i mean i grew up watching them yeah, like they were from like, like an the, institution right i mean <laughs> yeah but like the first from the first album like the really early early shows and then i kind of like lost touch of what they were doing for a couple of years when I, after I moved. Um, but, uh, but then I just kind of kept thinking about it and like, okay, like, well, who knows it, we'll see what happens. And then, um, uh, and then that's when Paul called me again, he was like, Hey, like they're still looking for a drummer. Would you, would you at all be into like, maybe, you know, if I handed, you know, pass your number on to them and I was like, okay, sure. You know, I didn't really think anything of it. And then that's when, I got the call <laughs> and uh, I just got a tape, you know, a, a little demo tape of some new stuff they were working on. And, and uh, I really liked, there was like six songs that was like from, ended up being on uh, group sounds. Is that? Uh, yeah. Group sounds. Yeah. So there were some demos of those, a couple of those songs and I really liked them. So um, yeah, man, next time I had like straight American <clears throat> slave, like white belt. There's a lot of really good tunes in that. Yeah. Yeah. So the next, the deal was next time I cruised out to go visit, you know, my family and stuff, uh, we would try and get together and, see what happens and it it clicked it worked out really good so yeah man so that's how that happened that's how, that's how you ended up in rocket from the crypt and that's you know you you knew what to expect because you knew from rocket from the crypt but what, i mean how was how was that experience i mean they're kind of like you know it's like not like a vegas stage show but there's like a show involved to it there's like you know the it's some pageantry if you will um and yeah it was pretty like I don't know, maybe it was a little bit intimidating at first because I had, I had known, you know, like that side of, of it. And I I had had no experience you know, in playing in a band at all that had that kind of a, I don't know, I don't want to say an act, but like just that sort of like, you know, dressing up in the same things and having like, cost, not costumes, but outfits yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and sort of that sort of thing going on. Like right. I, I, I had no experience with anything like that before. So I was like, okay, like it just it felt new, but but playing the music felt totally natural. It's, you know, just good, fun rock and roll. So, um, it, I got used to it pretty quick, I think. So, well, yeah. And it's, when you're doing something that tends to kind of bring joy to people too, it's like hard not to like, you know, you don't want to get too academic about it. Yeah. Like, we're having a good time. No, totally. Yeah. But it was like, <laughs> okay, I was, <laughs> I was lucky to also join a band that already had a really dedicated following, you know, like we weren't going in the clubs and being like, Oh, there's 10 people there, you know? Like, <laughs> yeah. Prove you, prove so far your existence. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's not like that yeah. at all. Yeah. Uh, so, okay. So we get, so that's, um, was it group sounds and live from camp X-ray. <laughs> Um, so that title always makes me laugh. I mean, it's not funny, but it still always makes me laugh. Uh, and then you got, you, at the same time, you got Earthless kind of spinning up. Um, and then, uh, what, so, wait, 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 okay. Uh, didn't you also, didn't you also join Battalion of Saints at, at one point? Yeah, um, that's kind of a loose term, I would say, like joining the band. Like, <laughs> um, right, okay. You, 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 play, you played with a battalion of saints for a while. Yeah, we did like maybe 
we did a really short tour of Cal- like maybe like three or five shows of playing with discharge and then um nice. maybe a, maybe like a handful of shows here like locally like in la you know off and on but um at the time i had just joined hot snakes so i think once yeah man right, that, right. <laughs> you're, you're taking me, you're taking me back to this time frame where like my life was just so like like Dude. I had like five bands going on at one time. For real? <laughs> I, I kid you not. This this isn't shtick. I thought there was multiple dudes <laughs> named Mario Rubicaba. I, I was like, it can't possibly be the same guy. Like, it, it, there's no way. <laughs> there's no way. Yeah, it was it was a wild time, man. There was five things going on, and I was playing and touring and doing it full full tilt. <laughs> so so hot snakes. You're you're coming in. Jason had done uh, the first two records. You know, they they were they they had a, they had their own defined thing that was like different from the Rocka thing, you know, different from the from Jehu, but like having like, kind of pulling from similar areas and also yeah. having his own voice. And so that's uh what the the red one, uh, Audit in Progress. Yeah, and yep. uh, obviously you 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 just generally have a different style than Jason. You're not going to pull Josh Freese with it necessarily, right? And so yeah, with those songs, like what? How did you? How do you approach being a hot snake? Well, I think the way I look at that record is, um, and when I joined the band was that's that's the first hot snakes record that was done as a as a full band. Um, the first two records were just Jason and John, and that was it. And then Rick would join in later and do his vocals, but he didn't really play guitar. I don't think on any of them on the first two records, maybe the second record. I'm not sure, but. Um, but on our record, that was the first record where actually Gar came in and, and would practice and, you know, and play bass on the record and stuff. And, you had people in a room um, playing together. Yeah, and Rick would come out and we wrote these songs together for the most part. Um, a lot of them John and I wrote together by ourselves. Um, and then Gar would come in when he could. But, um, but yeah, I mean, that was, that was the first record that was kind of done as a full band, I would say. Um, and, uh, you know, I think we just... I don't know. Some of these things that John was coming up with at the time were really, really different sounding compared to the first records. And um, I just sort of just let my natural, weird, tribal fills kind of type drumming come out and came up with some different beats. So yeah, I mean, the vibe. I mean, it was the same band, but the vibe was certainly like uh, way, way, way different. Yeah. Those. And it, what yeah. like, I thought was really cool when there was the Hot Snakes reunion too is there was the I don't know if it was just the one, but uh, there was that tour where you and Jason both went out, and I thought that was cool as, as hell because uh, the only other band I ever saw, did, Shiner did that. They did a Tim Dow and, uh, and Jason Green. Yeah. And I thought that mm-hmm. was rad, too, because it's like, oh, these are both awesome drummers that have their own style and do yeah. their own thing. And yeah, there's like totally. epochs of time. They're like, no, I like this era. No, I like this era. It's like, oh, well, everyone gets a little bit. You know, it's cool. Yeah, yeah, that was fun. <laughs> yeah, Jason and I like hanging out a lot, too, so it's good that. We're, we're pretty good friends as well. So it was fun to do that. <laughs> so you're, you're spending a lot of time with, with, with John Reese there. Uh, wait, wait, am I, I'm, sk- I'm skipping the Sultans. Right. Yeah. I another, mean... sh- another short lived, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you're a busy dude. <laughs> well, that happened right after rocket broke up the first or, you know, quit or whatever. Yeah. Stopped playing in 2005. So that was, I think that's when Sultan started doing stuff with me. Um, and, uh, yeah, so that just kind of happened naturally. I was playing with Dean, which is John's younger brother. We had another little band, side project band for a while. And then, uh, so yeah, we, we just started playing for fun and came up, came up with a whole little set list of new songs, but unfortunately they never got recorded. Um, yeah, was, which was kind of a bummer. So that's drag. Yeah, but played a few shows and did a little short tour. Nothing else. So, so. <clears throat> so with God, I'm just jumping around so much here. Sorry, but like with with Hot Snakes, it was it was uh, the there was that uh, that the Australian thing. The Australia there was Australian tour. You guys recorded a thing for uh, that radio station that ended up being like the live record, and that ended, oh, the, yeah yeah, and then, then that was it for Hot Snakes first go round. it was like i think you i think hot snakes broke up after that yeah pretty yeah, pretty right. short after that mm-hmm. and then rocket kind of announced a breakup shortly afterwards 
Uh, so, and around that same time, you're, um, uh, you got, you had another, there's like another Earthless record, I forget which one. Is it Rhythms? It's, that's after, it was around then? Probably, yeah, I think so. Yeah, that came out, I'm going to say like 2006 or 2007. Um, See, I, you know, <laughs> yeah, I can't remember. <laughs> so did, any, um, did any of that, like, you know, playing in Rocket, playing in Hot Snakes, did any of that, like, inform what you were doing in Earthless at all, or have they always kind of been, like, separate and distinct yeah. entities with their own? Pretty separate. You know, for a long time, um, I'd say Earthless was kind of the band that just sort of got tossed around, you know, other projects. Yeah. Um, you know, it was always the, the one, because, you know, we'd play a few shows here and there back then, but we didn't tour back then at all. Yeah, you know, that might have been the first record that came out. Because like, I don't think our first record came out to like, 2005 or something like that. So, um, yeah, you know, I always just did Earthless whenever I had spare time. Which it sounds like and, you had almost um, none of at the time. Exactly. <laughs> so, we'd, we'd go a year with maybe playing like one show for a little bit, you know. And then whenever I had some time at home, we'd, we'd do like some weekend stuff or something. But, um I don't know, around 2006 or 2007, uh, we signed to TP, Earthless did, and we came out with Rhythms. And then that's when we started to do a little bit more activity and stuff. They wanted us to you play a couple, like, remember that? I don't know if you remember CMJ back then, but like. Oh, man, yeah, I do yeah, remember just, CMJ, yeah. Yeah, and then South by Southwest. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, totally. So. <laughs> South by, exactly. <laughs> Which, were, that was, those things were totally fun. I mean, we met so many cool bands and, and people and, and and they were fun shows and stuff. So, um, yeah, we started to pick up a little bit more steam as far as like touring around that time. Seven years later after we formed. Right. I was going to say, so, so that's kind of, that's <laughs> kind of crazy to kind of keep something more or less on ice. Like, it seems like you, there has to be a really earnest and deep love for it to kind of be on, you know, Han Solo yeah, and the yeah. carbon chamber. Uh, well, if, I think, <laughs> you know, there was, the effort to do that, you know, to do Earthless was so little, or I mean, I don't mean that in like a negative way. I mean it in like to, for the three of us to get together and play, um, it, it was really easy. And whereas, whereas other bands like with Rocket, you're more song oriented, you got to go and practice your songs. You know, we practice right. two, three times a week and play you, the you're, set, you're make like, sure it's tight. Yeah. Make sure you know the transitions. Yeah. yeah. And, and Earthless, we just get in a room and, you know, forever. There's been so many times we haven't hadn't played in like a month or two months, and we just go fly to Australia and, and get on stage. You know what I mean? And, <laughs> and like, so I just mean it in that sense. Yeah, but, yeah. No, no, I get it. It's just that's that's sounds wild. I mean, it's 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 it sounds like a it sounds like it would use different muscle groups, so to speak. For, for <laughs> yeah, play, right. T- totally. <laughs> Uh, and then, I, well, at some point you do the you played Roadburn, right? Is that was that that's where the live album came out? Uh, yeah, a few, yeah. A couple years later, or something like that. It was somewhere in the two thousands, I think. Well, two thousand eight, maybe. I think. Um, yeah, I think it was two two thousand eight, actually. So and, the rumor uh, is that you weren't even aware that they were recording it, right? You know, I think they might have, like, told everyone in an email that like all the all the bands were getting recorded, you know, digitally, or whatever. But like no one paid attention to that you know so <laughs> go, yeah, um, whatever skip skip and, skip drink tickets no <laughs> yeah, yeah and and i think just everything coming culminating to that weekend was not you know kind of stressful like with planning and getting gear and, and just like doing all that kind of stuff like that was kind of the last thing that we were thinking about. Yeah, because you're, then, you're um, flying out to the Netherlands. So for those not familiar, I think most people that listen to the show know yeah. exactly what freaking Roadburn is. But for, for those that don't, it's a festival that's a long-running festival in the Netherlands. It's put on by music fans that just have a bunch of like cool, weird, heavy bands. and Yeah. It's like a destination event where you, you go to the thing and just like see cool stuff. But it's, it's in the freaking Netherlands, too. Yeah, yeah. Really, really, really awesome festival, though. So I hear. So, <laughs> uh, sorry, I didn't, didn't mean to didn't break up your flow, but I figured for the people no. that are like <laughs> frantically googling, like, what is it called? <laughs> right. Yeah. It's it's. I think it's been going on for close to seventeen years, eighteen years, or something. Yeah, it's been, like that. It's been, sure, but... been going on for for quite some time. Yeah. So, but um, you, you guys are getting like the like what what you're playing on together, like figuring it out and. 
Well, we only had, I think we had like a weekend of shows. It wasn't even like a tour. So this whole thing came together kind of last minute to play that the Roadburn Festival. And so um, we were trying to tack on two of the shows with, uh, with Dave uh, Sweet Apple from Witch with his band and the band called Graveyard. And um, so we were trying to just figure, figure it out to make it work. Um, but then, uh, you know, our Roadburn show was, um, you know, we were playing in the smallest room at the time. And then, uh, Cause, yeah, because they have different rooms just to paint the scene. They have there's different, <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's, there's different there's, scope and scale. To, uh, the room we Robert. were playing was called the Bat Cave, so it was the smallest room. It was like a 250 capacity room, and we were going to headline that. So that was that was a big deal to us. You know, we we're like, hey, like first time going over there, and we're going to headline this festival in the, in the 250 capacity room. Um, but then what happened, you know, last minute was like changed the kind of changed the course of, of of playing over there for a while and um you know last month there was a band called isis which yeah. uh <laughs> um kind of a crazy name to think about now but yeah it, they, in, in retrospect uh yeah rough but at the time <laughs> yeah <laughs> a different story different story entirely yeah um but they had a hour and a half time slot and they played like i think they only played like maybe half of that time allotted to him. So uh, Walter had come up to uh, to me and and was kind of panicked about them, you know, because they were the headliners on the main stage and they played a really short set. So he was worried that all the people from the main stage room were just going to try and go to all the small rooms and Crap it was just going to be, gonna yeah, be it was just going to yeah. be. So, um, yeah, he asked us to play on the, on the main stage and that, you know, we took it from there and, Kind of just uh, that's where that record came from. So. Oh, man. If somebody asks you if you're a god, you say yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, yeah totally. Dude, I think he was like, people? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> I remember him asking. He was like, "Do you think you guys can play for an hour?" I'm like, "Oh yeah." <laughs> 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 are you asking the right band <laughs> yeah <laughs> well yeah isn't that i mean isn't because that's like a it's like a two disc thing like i mean yeah it's ch- fucking two lps chock full like to like to the max yeah so. yeah but i mean it's <laughs> that's awesome i mean that's again that's a sort of like cinematic event it's like no like that never yeah. happens no that wouldn't happen either <laughs> <laughs> And then it just so happened that there was a recording of it that is pretty badass. Like it, it's a good, it's a very good representation of what you guys did. And I mean, did things because you did the uh, let's see, so that was like what two thousand. So you, you did a you did a thing with Russian Circles. I know uh, a couple yeah. years later, right? I mean, I mean, it seemed like it was mm-hmm. that was good for you, and that was sort of like a that was like a flashpoint that allowed cool things to happen for Earthless as an entity. Uh, yeah, from yeah, the sure. Yeah, definitely. So, but then by the same token, there's a lot of other stuff going on. There's uh, like other bands. I'm trying to. I'm trying to again. Again, if I'm screwing up the timeline here, please feel free to <laughs> correct me. But around the same time, I'll, I'll, prob- I'll probably mess you up even more. Yeah, you, don't worry. <laughs> I'm going to get the emails, so don't worry about it. I think about how dare you? First of all, how dare you? Secondly, uh, but that's when Keith and Dimitri were kind of starting to spin up what would become off. Uh, and then I, so I've had Keith on the show and I've had Steven on the show as well. And there was a, enough of a gap that I have no idea if there's any overlap for the origin story because I just don't remember anything that happened. But how did, how did you come to end up playing with those dudes? Hmm. Um, let me think here. Because it was around 2010 when off kind of, yeah, yeah, 2010. So, hold on here, I'm grabbing a beer. Um, uh, Take your time. I, well, it, there's this, obviously there's backstories to all bands, but um, but the off thing is, is kind of unique, obviously with the Stephen and Keith connection of knowing each other since Stephen was like 11 years old or whatever. Yeah. Like, I, but, like um, Stephen said when he was on the show, it's like your first show is a freaking black flag, which is amazing. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So there's, there's that connection, and he's like but 12. then there's also, yeah. 
like the whole uh, Keith and Dimitri, you know, um, connection of um, when Keith used to work for V2 and Dimitri's in Burning Brides. But then here's the weird little connect connect us thing. When my first tour with Rocket, um, okay, the first tour of Rocket, we played a few shows with Burning Brides with Dimitri's band. Burning Brides. We did like four or five shows with those guys. Good so band. that's why first. Like, I feel like yeah. most people don't like paying any attention to them, but I thought they were a good man. I, I, I yeah, yeah, yeah. So they were just kind of getting you know their feet going, and it was before they signed to V two. But um, so we did a few shows with them. So that's where I got to meet Dimitri. And then that same tour, at the, the last show, we played in L.A. And Keith came to that show. So that's where I first met Keith. Um, so those kind of seeds were, were sown, you know, just from meeting those two guys. Um, a couple years later, I, I filled in for a couple of shows for Burning Brides because Jason had just joined Burning Brides. And then he had to finish... Uh, hot snakes tour but then it was a weird overlap with um, uh, the brides got asked to open to do a tour with queens of the stone age and so there was this oh, right. overlap of that. tour yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah but and so, that's something you <laughs> you don't want I to was, say no to those shows yeah yeah exactly so <laughs> i was the the pin the pinch the pinch hitter you pinch know hitter, yeah. i came in and played you know a uh, week's worth of shows of burning brides um and then uh fuck what's the timeline here Okay, and then fast. So, so that was playing with Dimitri for the first time. Yeah, and so Dimitri and knows then... he, can play, he can play with you. He knows he knows like your your style and your hallmark. Yeah, like, that's always yeah that always yeah helps when you're thinking of you know when you're when you're going through the <laughs> when you're going through like when when you're picking dodgeball and you're you're picking teammates, right? Mm. You do, you know, I know you can play. You're good. Yeah, you're a great. Oh, you're a great goalie. You're a good kicker. You know. <laughs> and then I don't know what show it was. Uh, it was a show that. Earth was playing somewhere in LA and, and the promoter was like a really good friend of Keith's and uh, Keith had just given his number to pass along to me and I didn't really know what it was regarding. And then once I talked to Keith though, he had, he had this idea of, of starting a new band and, and uh, the, the initial idea was just to record something as fast as possible and, and just play like house parties and, and things like that, like backyard parties and keep it really, really low key and just like spur the moment. So Focus that was the initial fun, idea. Kind of low stakes. Low yeah, stakes. totally. <laughs> and then, um, and then I had never met Steven before. So, um, that I knew of him, but yeah. And then we got together and I think around 2010 and that was fuck, already 10 years ago. Man, time flies, dude. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, all right. Uh, and then, and then I'm, try, I'm trying to keep the parallel track. So then that starts to spin off, off is doing stuff. You know, it resonates with people. It, 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 it connects. There's, there's an audience for it. There's that first four EPs and some other recordings that happen after that. Then at, at, by the same token, uh, well, there's, there was a bunch. There was like, uh, it seemed like there was like every two years there was, there was like something that was, that was coming out. Um, for, yeah, we were, we were keeping busy, man. For first five years, we were like, it was full, full on. It was, yeah, recording and touring all the time. So, and I definitely got Keith's take on it. But what would you say for the shows? Like, as someone that like you know played in punk rock hardcore bands, like, would you what would you say the crowds were like initially with Off? Like, would, did you did you did they feel more like big rock crowd or did it feel more like punk rock crowd or something different, something new? Because I'm curious to what your take would be. Um, I would say, I mean, it just depends. Uh, I mean, when they were our tours, like if we were headlining, then they would be like pretty fun punk rock crowds. I'd say, you know, a lot of, yeah. it was, it was a good mix of, you know, there was obviously like the Keith fans that have been around forever. So right. there was like old, a lot of older guys and stuff, but, um, there was for a little bit, a little bit of a younger kind of a crowd coming to the people that just only knew of off and circle jerks or whatever, maybe, but. Um, you know, there's skaters and that kind of thing, but yeah, nothing too crazy. Nothing that really stood out like different to me. Well, yeah. And I'm just, I'm interested because it kind of seems like from from an outside perspective, it kind of seemed like off was doing like, you know, maybe a two thirds, like old punk rocker, but then also like there was this other third of like, Oh, like somehow these dudes that have been around and making music for a long time have like kind of like 
connected with like a different crowd. And that was just kind of interesting and neat to see, uh, I guess from, yeah. from an outside perspective, because you always want to have hope that like people will be into something that's new rather than like listening to the same fucking records for 30 years in a row. And yeah, uh, I don't know. yeah, for sure. That was, that was that. kind of, um, well, <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, you sparked, you sparked something that, um, I remember like when we were starting to think about touring, the like how did how did we want to go about it because i remember like the warp tour existed back then and we didn't want to you know we were, we almost signed epitaph uh, right at the very beginning but then like one of the guys that worked there or i'm not sure but he's like yeah get you guys on the warp tour and, you know like and that didn't really go none of us were excited about the doing that type of thing we we wanted to do something that played you know like Back then, it was like the Pitchfork Fest or something that was like, you know, playing with like Deer Hunter or something like that. You know, like we wanted to play different things. We didn't want to be stuck on the stage with the Exploited, and, you know, or just like right. bands that were like. <laughs> Perfect example. I mean, yeah. No, no, I know what you're talking no, about. No because offense, it's like, you, but no, 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 just like them. the typical lineup, you know. Yeah, like the typical kind of thing that would be so typical. For real. And, and so, like, the idea would be, yeah, once you say, like, oh, yeah, Warp Tour, and then you can kind of like see the path out like you can envision like the 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 possible future of like okay so that means the next five years are gonna look like this and you know and it's just sort of like uh, right okay yeah. <laughs> but also at the time there was there was a lot of uh really cool newer hardcore bands coming out too i mean there was totally. you know c- ceremony and trash talk and things like that like there was a whole new little crop of bands that we would rather have kind of you know toured with those bands instead of doing the, the the older kind of just typical bill yeah yeah like bands yeah. that were <clears throat> taking like the actual idea of punk rock rather than just doing civil war reenactment of it yeah uh which is mean but it's also correct and <laughs> <laughs> uh so okay so yeah off's going and then there's uh, was it 2016 2017 that there was the there was it was that hot snakes tour where you and Jason kind of did uh, double duty. Am I am I right? Yeah. yeah, it had to be twenty sixteen. I think we did a couple of them when when hot snakes got back together. Um, we were trying to figure out well who's going to play, and then uh, I we just ended up saying well let's let's we'll share the bill for the whatever. We did a few tours with both Jason and I, and then um, just you know we just kind of played it by ear. So um, we were just start doing that a little bit and then but that was when the sub pop thing came up so um you know i think i did maybe like almost a year of touring with hot snakes with with jason as well um and then um but earthless signed to a new label and we were starting to get busy as well so i was just uh focusing on that and doing that for the last couple of years i'd say yeah you you weren't you weren't the dude that you were <laughs> 10 years earlier we're gonna literally do all of it at the same time and somehow i don't know be in multiple places at once i don't exactly know how you pulled it off but yeah <laughs> <laughs> so then you you got you got all the stuff going on with off you, you got the hot sinks stuff that's happening and then by the same token you have earthless growing earthless is kind of like finding its people's and in some cases, you know, there's people that just have lots of maybe, you know, weed related paraphernalia on their on their apparel and, you know, fine. That's yeah. okay. uh, <laughs> it also but to me, it almost kind of seemed like what Earthless did was coming from a more, I don't know, like coffee perspective, <laughs> like like almost SSD <laughs> style. You know what I mean? Not like gone or anything like that, but like coming from, uh, yeah, coming from that punk rock, coming from 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 hardcore I mean, did you ever, is it just, when, when you do Earthless stuff, is it just whatever comes out, comes out? Uh, do you have, like, an idea for direction? I mean, it's, it's it's. I, I guess I'm fascinated by free music that actually is engaging. Because, yeah. <laughs> and uh, I, I don't know if that if you would call it free music necessarily, but it seems like the, the times I've seen you, it's always been badass. But it's, how much of that is planned? How much is, 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 is like, do you have, like, things that you want to try to do or is it just like all right let's just see where we go um there's there's definitely structure in there um i mean when well, we yeah, it's, i don't it's, mean you're like freaking the boredoms or something no no, no distance yeah boredoms, but. but like i'm just what i'm trying to say is i guess when we get in a practice room and and start you know 
writing for records or playing in, in general, um, a lot of the ideas that become structured ideas just start from being improvised ideas. Um, so like, you know, I've, I've recorded a lot of the, of the practice sessions on four track or whatever. And, and a lot of the, you know, a lot of ideas would get lost if I didn't take those things. So going back and finding some of these riffs that were like happen for maybe a minute, you know, on, the, on this tape oh, and sure. then taking it back, taking it back to the next time that we play together and be like, Hey, like, listen to this, you know, let's, let's just play that for a little while. And then, playing that for like 15 minutes and and then things come out of that and then before you know it you're just kind of working on this this piece and so there's you know i would say there's like structured little traffic cones here and there and in between (laughs) in between them you can just kind of go off and and kind of do this thing and i mean I, i don't know as a drummer like it's fun to be able to create these sounds like these little patterns of things to do that you know will make isaiah kind of go do different things and then reel it back in you know if i speed it up or slow it down then like that changes everything and he'll do some of these things that make me respond off of him it's kind of you know it's just it's just this weird call and response thing or something that like yeah and you guys have that like telepathy sorry to interrupt but you you have that kind of when you like have a certain uh, uh, kinship and affinity for another player, but you also kind of know their musical shorthand. Like you can just kind of, you can reach new stuff just by yeah. knowing you don't, you don't have to think about what's happening. You just know to expect it. And then it's, it's, it kind of hits differently. At least that, that's what I found. Yeah. And being able to read each other, you know, to, to play and when, to, when I know he wants to kind of go a different direction, then I'll take it, you know, somewhere else too. So, you know, I, I, we've we've talked this long. I haven't even mentioned anything having to do with skateboarding. I think it's, it would be disingenuous uh, to not mention like you you like you were pro for a while. What's that? Yeah, yeah. what what who what's that? Yeah, exactly. Are you doing any of that? In, in, uh, well, uh, yeah. Normally, I've been kicking off these episodes by asking people what they're doing in quarantine. Uh, and I just I did something else. I was like, I think I oh yeah, I was dissing my own my own uh, mixology skills of <laughs> on the fader. That's what it was. <laughs> but uh i mean you, you you were like you were a pro skateboarder for a while for like uh you know early on yeah um, yeah early 90s i mean yeah that's not a question that's a statement but uh how would how did that inform what you've done in music and did it or was it just like a parallel track like you know you know how you started playing in in, in punk uh post hardcore post hardcore or whatever you want to call it because um, I feel yeah. like there was a, and it's hard to it's hard to describe for people now, but I feel like especially around that around that time, it was they kind of went hand in hand. And I don't know if that's still is that still the case. I don't know. I don't know. I'm not not the person to ask. I guess, but I think so. I think I think. I mean, from going off of people that I know, you know, that are 20 years younger than me, um, I, I I see, you know, a lot of the a lot of the bands that Earthless plays with, you know, here in San Diego, our friends, they're skateboarders and amazing musicians so it definitely goes hand in hand still for i'd say a a good little crowd of people but for me you know since since whenever i started skating and i think i started in like 82 or 83 um going there was there was one skate park here that was left from the 70s uh del mar skate ranch and i was lucky to live you know a couple cities away from it so i would go there whenever i could and um the locals there always had that's that's where i got into punk from was going to the skate park um they were blasting always good music to skate to and stuff and get you know get pumped on skate just be there all day you know and uh that kind of i don't know i i would say that sort of just really planted the seeds of like listening to that stuff more and more I'd already, I'd, I've been playing drums most of my life, so I already played drums still, you know, back then, but I didn't really play with anyone. So, um, yeah, man, skating and music, they're, they're like the same to me. So, yeah, it's, and, and the reason why I specifically wanted to bring it up was also just because, it, like, it was one of those things that when you kind of first came to my attention, 
somebody uh-huh. mentioned as I was like, oh yeah, he was a he was a skater. I'm like, ah, that makes sense. And there was something just in like the propulsiveness of it that was of, of how you play drums. It was like, ah, that I get that now. That's totally cool. Not like to say that that's like the only thing you can do or anything along those lines. Uh, but <laughs> there, there seems to be. There's a, there seems to be a certain corollary I found with folks that are deep into music that also skated as well. That's it's I I, I I can't define it. I'm the wrong person to freaking. I'm not gonna write the book on it. You know what I mean? But it's <laughs> it seems like there's there's there is that deep affinity, and it, it, I think that's really interesting because the whole skating culture. I feel like it almost gets misrepresented quite a bit. And I don't know. I'm just curious if uh, you know—is is that just a me thing or what? Because you still, you still, uh, I mean, you still kind of skate now, right? And you and you were you still doing stuff at Black Box? No, no, I haven't worked there. In, well, fuck, it's been like ten years I since been I a while. started off. Yeah, um, but I mean, throughout fucking many, many, many years, I've worked on and off at many skateboard places and stuff, and but. Um, you know, uh, skating and, and music together, just like, it's it's really just been, I don't know, I, I get the same feeling of doing both, um, like, adrenaline-wise, I guess, you know? Yeah, um, yeah. And improvised, like, you know, improvising is such a big part of both things, I think, like, just being spur of the moment and, like, you know, um, whether, you know, skating, skating vert or skating street or pools, it's like, you're like you're improvising when you're skating. I think a lot of the time, at least I was, you know, like so many little things that you would be set up to do would just come out of nowhere. Like, you know, whatever your next trick was, like sometimes I, I try sure to plan it. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, you know, if like, I'm, I'm going to be a nerd here and talk like, but like sometimes no. you would do uh, a, you know, uh, a 50, 50 grind. And I'm in like, in my mind, I'd be setting up to do just a backside air, but like I'd come out of the 50, 50 grind and maybe I'd be a little bit more at a straight angle. So I'd be, Oh, you know what? I'm going to do an alley-oop lean air instead of a backside air and like i'd go for it and like the body would be just twisting the right way and and, hey you know what like sometimes you'd make it and it would be the best like feeling you know what i mean like like doing tricks like last minute on the spur of the moment is like for me that's the funnest thing about skating it's just like the spontaneity of trying something and like having it kind of come together is like I don't know. It's kind of the same thing on drums or guitar, like going for something and making it work, you know? Yeah. No, totally. And that's, like, if, that, like that if you sense. listen to like, listen to like, like Greg Ginn play guitar. Right. And <laughs> every, every time that guy plays it, it's different. You know what I mean? He, yeah. he does all these fu- like fucked up, like harmonics and string bends and stuff. And it's like, dude, he's like, he's like going for it every time and it's like it's not the same every time so <laughs> it's cool yeah and it's 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 interesting to see how and it's been a, a frequent topic on the show of late of just stuff from the past is uh, can, given different context now and, and 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 treated differently but i mean if you if you look at those like yeah, I mean, you remember those like Target videos of like the the punk rock bands and stuff, like the like Black Flag. Oh yeah, Target. yeah. And uh, oh, that's like one of my favorite all time. Yeah, like, totally. Right, I still have those tapes, like you know, somewhere here in the basement. I don't, I, I, I don't even think I have VCR anymore, but I still got the tapes. I'm not gonna get dude, rid of them. There, I mean, I just since you since you brought that up, it's like like the Target videos of Black Flag. They're playing "Thirsty and Miserable." That's like yes. that's my favorite all time Black Flag song. <laughs> it's, it's like so <laughs> rad and it's like they're just just <laughs> ripping it up like in this like you know small space too like where it's like, oh god man it's like some yeah. fucking you know kids like rec room or something it's like what are they playing what's happening yeah. who allowed this it's great i i've been going through my garage the last couple nights because i mean what else are you going to do at like midnight and <laughs> you're quarantined but uh i have these two 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 boxes of like u-haul boxes of like v- vhs tapes and I have, you know, I've probably got like five or six flip side videos that were all, you know, the Target videos and stuff. And fuck, I don't have a VCR player, but I just cannot seem to get 
I, you know, I can't let myself get rid of these tapes yet. I'm like, <laughs> they mean a lot to me, man. Well, because it's something. So, so I, I'm formulating a theory about that right now because I thought about this before, and I think part of it's that even though, yeah, all that stuff's on like YouTube or whatever, there's yeah. something about it when it's like been a formative experience of like, oh shit, like let's throw the black flag tape on, you know, and like, right, and you watch it with your friends and like, you know, have burritos or whatever. And it's like the same deal that before there was, you know, Spotify and, you know, music available on demand for forever. It'd be like, Oh, let's over, let's head over to Rick's house. You know, he's got the, uh, he's got the minor threat record. Oh, cool. <laughs> yeah. You know, what, you know what I mean? We're just like, you're getting the, 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 the cultural, like the, the friendship part of it is tied up with the cultural experience as a uh, scarcity. Yeah, uh, for sure. Like the, the not available kind of thing. And, Dude, I'm the same way. Like, why am I carting these goddamn VHS tapes around? You know what I mean? Like, right. I mean, yeah. F- f- fuck's sake. And the reason why is because, like, oh, man. Like, I'll, I'll pick it up and I'll, like, just remember it. Like, oh, geez. Like, it, instantly it's it's like a – it's time travel. Yeah. One of my, yeah. my first my first uh, punk rock buddy that we, we skated together, but he lived up the hill from me. And then we had a record store that was, like, down, the, you know, a couple streets from our house. And uh, at, we would – we would save our lunch money and we would pull together, you know, whatever a record cost back then, which is like seven bucks or six bucks. And we would like, you know, both pull our money together. We'd save our lunch money. And then like, Oh, you know, and a couple weeks later we had, we both went in on like sex pistols tape or something like that. You know, <laughs> we're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. well, <laughs> you, you're going to get the tape for a week and then I'll get the tape for a week. Yeah. And you know, like, <laughs> yeah no totally like I'll, you, then you save up and get like a pack of tapes and you'd like dub a shitty copy of it and like yeah you know, and, and then like you know whatever the dog eats it or it gets stuck in someone's stereo and oh, you, have to, God. Oh, you got a pencil you know. i still it's weird like i i still have this copy of di ancient artifacts oh, man. album and uh i bought that record you know like whatever you know it was one of the first five punk records i bought probably but um i would take it over to uh was the you know uh danny way he's a very popular prof- professional skateboarder but his older brother damon him and i we would hang out and, and we were both in a punk and stuff and uh so i didn't have a record player at my house at the time so i would take the record to his house and so we had di we had seven seconds the crew oh, and then we had I think, what else did we have i think we had a, a buzzcocks record and so we we listen you had to have either buzzcocks or descendants with that yeah like those three records man we would just, those were like our soundtrack and like you know for like middle school you know early high school and uh i still have the copy of di it's so fucking scratched and like beating the shit like i can't play it Right, yeah, yeah. It's available as an art piece and piece of history only. Save it for I've tried. I've, I've tried selling it for five bucks multiple times when I've sold records at like record shows, and like no one's ever bought it. So I'm like, you know what? It's a science. Like I'm just gonna fucking like put it in my garage, like my little workbench, and like it's like a little prized possession. <laughs> that's awesome I mean, and it's funny too that it's it's you know just from the memories alone like you know it's, it's totally worth saving it's not like it's gonna take up that much room really but then also i know that feeling of like, yeah oh whatever someone can get like some some use out of this fine right and then they're like no no money we can't that's got no value i'm like oh okay well yeah i take a look at the vinyl and it's like it literally looks like someone carved like someone's initials into it and so someone's like, yeah, it's not going nowhere <laughs> so uh that's i mean that's awesome and i think that's for me that's very relatable maybe maybe not for everyone else but that is incredibly relatable i've been in that same situation <laughs> so tell me about click it at iktawi and because i just blasted right past that band uh, we, oh we yeah we went earlier we totally fucking skipped that man. yeah i mean i was just <laughs> I wanted to at least touch everything once because I'm like, I have no idea what we're going to be talking about. Then people ask me, what are you guys going to talk about? I don't fucking know. I guess we'll see. Uh, Except for the fact that I actually do have a plan a lot of times. But there's so (laughs) much to cover. I wanted to make sure to get to a lot of it. Uh, Wild band and kind of like a band that people still like. It's one of those bands that people kind of discover every year. and, And which is astounding because I think the name's awesome. But I don't think I spelled it correctly for the first five years. I knew you guys were a band because I don't think anyone did, man. 
I was I was looking through last night. I was looking through. I was going through stuff, and I found this my file of um, you know some skate slides, and then but I found this little file I had of uh, the the first tour we did, Click It At. Yeah. And man, it was like we played in Seattle. We How played a couple shows. Did you get? On oh my god <laughs> dude <laughs> we we played this show with sunny day real estate and like our name it like it was every every letter was like misspelled and like the <laughs> <laughs> like how did you get it this wrong <laughs> <laughs> so is it was it like K- k-l-i-q-u-e <laughs> K- 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 Q- yeah, it, i mean what, what yeah. is there to say? Like ha- having a diff- having a difficult band name is always going to be a, a cross to bear. I think. Right. We were we were surprised though that it was so misspelled. Like it was misspelled so badly because the name was actually taken from uh, from from up in Oregon. You know, like around that native kind of area around there. So oh, we're sure. like, okay. We thought we thought people would would know about it a little bit more. You know, like up there at least, like. Like down here, no one knew what it meant at all. But like (laughs) up there, we thought it, you know, they would get maybe a couple letters, right? A a baseline (laughs) frame of reference, maybe, but apparently not. But uh, but no, um, yeah, really, really a fun band to play in. Um, That was, I would say, that was probably the first band I really, really, truly discovered um, just free being a free drummer to do whatever the fuck i wanted man like like just like kind of controlling the thing in a way you know like totally um, like and that was like one of the first uh for me sorry to interrupt which is what i do on the show but the (laughs) like that was one of the first kind of like hardcore bands of of that era they listened to i was like oh man this is like this is like the the drummer's like doing stuff that's like driving driving the band and that's really cool and everyone's kind of flying off like the left the right you know over here from that and it, it stuck out in my mind because of that. Also, in the fact that I was like, "What are they called?" <laughs> right, right, yeah. Besides, besides the name, though, but but the, but the, the thing the about music that band was, that was like, cool no, because is what I was, was trying to get at because of the fact. Yeah, that it was. It was, it was it, it, I, I mean, I think there's an antecedent to what you did in that band to to many things later on, and I could I could see where there'd be a corollary to Earthless. And yeah, totally. Yeah. See, I mean, with Click Attack, those all those little songs came out of jams. You know, that was another thing that was very similar, I would say, in vibe to Earthless, like mentality, um, not the sound, but like they all came out of just jamming, you know, like nothing was ever planned. No one had riffs coming into playing at all. Like everything just came from nothing, you know, in a room, just getting in a room and playing and then like coming up with stuff as we went. Um, there was no predetermined riffs ever with that band. And um you know, playing playing drums of that shit was like fuck, man. Like the live shows were, I mean, for me, they're they're still like, I really wish you know, <laughs> it could be like ninety five again. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's it was good times. It's yeah. sort of like that, and that's that's also kind of like a, of the era too that you know you don't mind playing like the dingy ass, crusty basement. You know, like it's, it's, you're like, hell yeah, we're doing it. Let's go. Yeah. Um, and uh, I, I think, well, it's, I think it's easier to have that sense of adventure when you're younger, for sure, which a lot of people focus on. But I think right. you can still keep some semblance of that while also wanting, you know, like, hey, man, I don't, I'd like to have some place to sleep where, you know, there's, there's not a cat pissing on my head or something along those lines. <laughs> <laughs> no, totally. You know, I mean, with, you know, during click attack years the we did a couple tours but um you know every show we played in that band until the last show actually was was all ages i think we we only played one 21 and over show and that was actually ended up being the last show um not planned last show it just was it last is, show. It's one of those things which is in the, and, the true nature of that style of band of like being yeah like, oh, yeah that was the last show totally. oh what and <laughs> i remember it seemed you know it for us, it seemed weird to be playing a a, a, a club. It and um, you know, I mean, nowadays it seems weird to, to be playing a tour full of all ages shows. That's so infrequent, you know. Um, and it's not because I don't want to. It's just you know, it's just something that we're not 
maybe as in touch with i don't know um i love all of just shows but they're just not as frequent in what we do so yeah you know, when we have an opportunity to make something cool happen with, with all ages things, um, I definitely like to look into it and, and, and take that up because I, I think it's really important. Like for me, you know, seeing so many things you know, as a teenager and, and like whatever, before I was 21 that like really influenced my playing or whatever bands I ended up joining or playing in later. Um, you know, it's, 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 you gotta still like try and do shit for kids, you know? I think that's a really important point. And it's something that doesn't get talked about nearly enough. And yeah, I guess I'm just saying that's a good point, And I agree with you. I mean, <laughs> well, well, I, the, the thing that makes me think about that is like, we've had this, we've had this venue here called the Che Cafe Shea for Cafe, so long. Yes. I got, oh, I love and, it's still there. Like I, I used to play that place like, you know, whatever, like freaking 14 years ago or something along those lines. I love that. It's yeah. I love it. It's a fucking, it's a little shithole. It sounds like shit, you know, whatever. There's nothing special about it besides that. It's like, has this cool vibe and, you know, that's what makes it special. I, I love that yeah. spot. And, um, you know, I, I never thought about it at all, but earthless played one, one or two times at the Che cafe when, you know, a long time ago, but, and those shows weren't really crowded, you know, maybe there was like 30 people there, something like that. But like the, the kids that were there, you know, now they're in the like mid twenties and, you know, they, you know, come up to us or they've said to, you know, a lot of people when we used to have a record store, um, they were at that Shea Cafe show. Um, you know, that, I don't know, that mean to me that means something that like, totally. there's people that are, that would want to form a band or like try and do something, you know, like not based off of that show alone, but that show helped, you know, motivate something. It, and it like being someone, part of the ecosystem, right? It's part of an ecosystem and, 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 you know, like as, new life forms develop, <laughs> you know, you, you get the alchemy of like, Oh, I saw this band. Right. They, they were rad. Cause of this and this band and, and they, yeah, to, to be part of that is rad because think about your own music and listening to bands, <laughs> you know, that you loved and like being like, Oh man. Yeah. That's so, that's so cool. Play that one again. And, and so, I mean, it's the same thing with like record stores, you know, you can't, you can buy online all you want, you know, and you can get a cool collection from buying online, but there's something to be said about going, having a local record shop and going and and being able to meet people, um, you know, that have similar or totally different interests in you. And, you know, it's like, fuck man, how many times have I like throughout the years seen the same guy at the record store? And like, maybe for two, two years, I'm like, Oh, there's that motherfucker again. And then like, yeah. but for some reason, yeah, yeah. you know what I mean? Like you end up like talking that you end up talking to them. And then like, I, dude, I've, I've met some of the people I've met at record stores, you know, throughout my time, I've like never would have thought I would have become friends with them or like, I would have like even like had anything in common with. And somehow we like, you know, um, <laughs> struck up a conversation over, I, you know, so many different topics, you know, um, of a, of a record or even just like you know like hey like um i was looking at that or i don't know like it's just it's just so it's just a, a place where it's so unique that something can happen you know and um i mean for me for personally speaking you know a couple of my bands have come out of you know meeting people through record stores and places like that shows and stuff and, so. Well, it's cultural shorthand, right? I mean, I, I still remember. I mean, I used to work at a record store, and uh, you know, yeah, yeah. The, the pay was not great, but no, no, no. <laughs> but I got to like discover like you know new badass yeah. stuff like literally every week, and turn people on to to really cool records too. And I, I, I still remember to this day. It wasn't in my record store because I, I worked at what I <laughs> what I call the uh, the fourth coolest record store in Berkeley, uh, out of four, and. But I remember at Amoeba one time I just saw this I saw this guy like looking through the you know flipping through the bins and like was looking at a birthday party record and I was like oh yeah that record's fucking awesome just out of nowhere because I was like I just felt like I should let you know that that's awesome and then we end up striking up a conversation become good friends turns out we know like a million of the same people we go to all the same shows still friends of that guy to this day and it was just like right. I saw him pick up a record I liked and that, yeah yeah. 
And like, yeah. you know, for some people, I'm sure the introverts in the audience will listen to that and like, oh my God, that sounds terrible. But, <laughs> <laughs> but for me, it was awesome. And, yeah. And I, I kind of look, I kind of look at it in, in a situation like that where when there's common cause, like when there's common cause for something, like you know there's certain things that you will probably share interest-wise with with that person. And I think records, maybe not as much as they used to be, but for the most part, are, are there's certain records that are definitely like that, you know? And I think that's... I, I think that's awesome. And I think that's, that's like you yeah. bring up an important point about the record stores, like the place of congregation, not right now, of course. Right. <laughs> but the record stores, the place of congregation is really important. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think it's unique that you, like you said, you know, the birthday party, um, you know, there's, there's like certain bands that I think bring out that maybe uh, emotional enthusiasm to say something about, you know what I mean? Like, like, um, if someone's picking like up a missing I'll, person's I'll, record. You're not going to have the same reaction. You're like, Oh yeah. Right. That's fine. Yeah. <laughs> but like for, for like, I was saying something about void, void yeah, and chrome, like, yeah, yeah. like, 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 like earthless, like everyone in earthless, like, like Mike and Isaiah, we, we all love void and we all love chrome. And like, so, you know, it, the, those are kind of specific, I don't know if niche is the right word, but like there, if you really like those bands, you really like those bands. So the same with the birthday party. It's like if you see someone kind of like, oh, like picking up that record and like maybe they don't know what it is. Yeah, like, they, this looks they, interesting. Yeah, <laughs> they they should know. Yeah, you need to that know it's that fucking, fucking yeah. Good. <laughs> like you know, at at the possibility of of sounding you know like a fucking fool or whatever or like being whatever. It's like you should still know that record is amazing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, that record will change your life. I don't want to sound like a weirdo, but I just need you to know that. Yeah. Like I, it, yeah. It, I had I had a friend who uh, I forget, God I forget which record it was. It doesn't even matter. But he was like, it was something from the dollar bin, but it was something awesome. But I didn't know it. And he was like, buy that record right now, and if you don't love it, I will give you the dollar. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> Jesus, okay, okay right yeah. on. And whatever it was, I, I, I wish I could it'd be better sure if I could remember what it was, but it was, but it was badass. Whatever it was, yeah, was like, oh, you're totally right. I don't, you don't have to give me a dollar. Don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> uh, oh, uh, so back over to Earthless for a minute, uh, and away from this from record store talk with Conan and Mario. The. Uh, <laughs> You did that? What? So, that was Suzuki from Can. You you yeah. did you did some you did some stuff with how the first of all how did that come to pass and how freaking awesome was that? I guess in in that order. Um, let me think. When because you were doing okay, like a residency, so, uh, yeah, or right? the, yeah. The 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 Roadburn residency was was idea was coming being tossed around from and so I was talking with Walter who is the uh, Roadburn organizer Impressive. head chief you know yeah the, the main guy <laughs> and which was actually going to be our 10-year you know roadburn anniversary from the first time we played roadburn and uh, live at roadburn record so we were trying to make something really cool happen and um we had we had talked about a couple different ideas of like maybe try to jam in with someone from you know this band or that band or whatever yeah. But then, uh, then Walter came up with Damo Suzuki, Fine. and um, and r- right away, <laughs> I mean, right away, I was just like, yes, like yeah, bring it on, let's make it happen. And for for me personally, it was, it was kind of like this, like not revenge or redemption thing, but um, back to the Che Cafe, Damo Suzuki was doing this tour. Um, some years ago where he was every town he would just have kind of like a pickup band and he oh, would like play Chuck with very style or something okay yeah 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 so every every city he was playing with different different cats like you know and just kind of jamming or whatever and uh, i went to go see him when he played the che cafe and i i i mean fuck i hate to sound like a dick but man the the the, the backup band that he had that night was just not like it was just the wrong group of cats playing with that guy. And like, I would, I just was, I don't know. I was, I was frustrated, you know, it wasn't that I thought that I should be there. It wasn't that I thought it should have been earthless. It, it wasn't any of that. 
I just did not you, think you it, didn't think they were there. I mean, this is this is the yeah. person that like <laughs> it was redefined the, you you know, a genre, created its own genre. You know, right. take of it what you will. You should be playing with ace players. And so, for whatever, for my own personal uh, envisionment of what I was hoping the night would be, it didn't turn out that way. So, um, so whatever. Fast forward, you know, ten years or some of that. So here's our chance to play with Damo, and and so that was kind of like. And let's 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 make this happen, and um, yeah, so yeah, we did it, and it was really really fun. It was all improvised. He, you know, we didn't really think we were going to do any songs with him in the first place, but it was cool that he was on the same wavelength of like, I don't want to do anything predetermined, um, right. you know, because <laughs> well, Walt, Walter, he had he had rented like a practice play, you know, space for us to. Work get together out. and jam yeah, yeah, before yeah, totally. and he and then damo was just like no nah, like let's just let's just go on stage and see what happens and so we're like yep let's, <laughs> yep well you're talking to the right dudes for that <laughs> exactly you know like we just fucking snapped our fingers and we're like yep let's just fucking let's go for it and it was fun i had i had a really good time i mean it, and it, it, like in, that go ahead sorry. that got that got recorded as well. I, I was gonna say, yeah, yeah. It's, 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 you guys have a pretty good track record for uh, for that. That's it. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, are you thinking about it like at all at the time, or, you, or just like, wow, this is weird, or like you're like, this is rad, and we are doing it. Like, is there is there ever like a moment of of sort of uh, not doubt, but just sort of like acknowledgement of like a bizarre situation, or is it just like hell yes? A little bit of everything, I'd, I'd say. Um, I mean, I remember being a little, for me personally, I was a little bit nervous just because, like, I don't know, you know what I mean? It, it's, it, I wasn't nervous about playing so much, but it's just more like, okay, like, are we going to be, is everyone going to be on the same page? You know, we had an extra player with us. Um, we had the, uh, his name is Ryu from uh, Kikugaku Moyo. He's the one that plays the electric sitar with him. He joined sure. in with us as well on, on the Damo Jam. So um, we were just kind of trying to, you know, um, make sure that we were all sort of kind of like just together as a mindset, you know, mm -hmm. um, going into it without doing any plan planning. Yeah. So, um, so how, does that converse, <laughs> how does the conversation about not having a plan <laughs> let me let me tell you we you get you get <laughs> five people and we're just gonna look at each other and be like shrug our shoulders and walk out there. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> that's sort of how it went <laughs> that's awesome and a good old have fun you know but um but no that was really special that was a really fun really really um uh, memorable um event you know damo's a he's a fucking sweetheart he's one of the coolest people i've ever met so fucking down to earth like you name it man he was really really cool yeah it's always nice when people aren't dicks huh Enjoy. definitely yeah yeah for sure yeah <laughs> as, like as a life ethos and and also with uh with, with with music folks as well yeah but i mean it's like i can't it's 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 different because i mean like yeah like if i think about it i'm like oh my god like we, we were like playing with the singer from tago mago or you know this and that right. it's yeah it's you it's could be like way you know, in your head about it in a really bad way yeah yeah so it's like i i couldn't go into it thinking like that you know what i mean it's like for me it's like like i mean fuck can is like top top five favorite bands all time favorite bands for me yeah, um of course. and it's but you know, once we were all together and we met and stuff, it's like you know everyone everyone's on is an equal. It's like you go into I had to go into it just thinking like you know what like hey man we're we're all on the same cylinder like mindset and and uh, I think that's how you go go out there and end up kicking ass. Did you 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 told you told them we're all on the same cylinder? Is that what you said? <laughs> I didn't tell them that. No, oh, but I'm just I'm just saying <laughs> yeah, yeah, in yeah, my yeah, yeah, it's all river. Yeah, in yeah. my in my mind, we're all on the same cylinder. We're all on the same plane. Yeah, you know? yeah, okay. I, same I, playing I, field. I see what you're saying. Yes. 
I was, yeah. wasn't trying to give you spinal tap dialogue in a, <laughs> a point at my for your band. Sorry. No. So there's, you know, we've, we've talked about with the appeal of earthless that there's a lot of folks coming from the more stone rock side of things as, 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 as it is known <clears throat> and everything that comes with that. And you guys kind of come in from a different place with that. And I'm trying to, I'm trying to be judicious about this, but when you're, when you're playing with a lot of these, a lot of these different bands, I mean, do you feel like there is common cause? Do you feel like you are, you're able to find like the through line for what they're doing and what you're doing to like, make it like, Oh yeah, this is cool. Or is it, is it a bit of a bummer sometimes that you're, you're, you're playing with the uh, bong hits and the, uh, <laughs> and the spilled water or whatever, you know, I mean, where <laughs> There's there's no way for me to say this without being insulting, but I think I think it's a genre that is a very much a sound genre, and yeah, that's, that's some for some bands it's all they have, and I think, right. I think you guys have a really cool sound, and and it's not that you guys are necessarily song based, but there's like tactical things that you, that you guys are doing to achieve certain goals, and it's very hypnotic in a way, like it, it, it does something and it kind of, it, like, like we said, and we've established like I think two or three times now it hits differently because it's coming from like a punk rock place. But do you find that there is common cause with bands that are more the typical marijuana leaf merch um, style? I, I don't really, I don't know if I go into it. It's a loaded question. You can answer that. Anytime yeah. You, want. <laughs> you know, I mean, well, I'll just, I'll go, I'll start move, from sorry. this. <laughs> I'll start from this. Okay. From, you know, playing, if we're playing festivals, you know, sometimes there's going to be festivals that are just like loaded with bands that are, you know, for lack of a better word, they all kind of sound pretty similar. Yeah. Um, and that's just the way it is with, with, any of the bands I play in, you know, like there's these festivals that Rocket plays with and everyone just has the same three chords going on. You know, it's like, it's everyone has the same little riff pattern. Um, so, I mean, that happens with Earthless all the time too. But when, when, when Earthless sets up our tours, if we're doing a headline tour of our own, um, I'm, we're pretty careful about like trying to pick bands that either are local support or bands that we tour with um like we we try to pick bands that are pretty different from what we do or are even in the mix of what we do um the last tour we did which fuck man i really i'm, I'm really missing that tour it was fucking so much fun it probably a um, hundred thousand years ago at this point yeah <laughs> and it was just last december <laughs> but we had our when there was touring <laughs> <laughs> yeah um we had a band from san diego called sacramani which is like they're like our little nephews you know um we love them dearly and they're they're a psychedelic rock band but they're like they're so different they're like really melodic they're also really powerful they they're shredders as players and you know a lot of them skate they're good skateboarders <laughs> but um they're oh, super <laughs> yeah totally and they're they're from San Diego and they're, they're amazing. Uh, good friends of ours. They opened up the tour and then we got a band from, uh, from based out of Berlin called maggot heart that, uh, I'm pretty good friends with. And they were touring the U S a couple, you know, throughout the year. And this, uh, it just worked out to have them be like the main support. And they couldn't be any further from what earthless does. They're sort of a crossover. Um, they have, I would say like punk ideal punk mentality, but um, maybe more of a kind of a hard motorhead meets okay. sort of Voivod sort of type sound. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, female fronted, um, really, really amazing songs and, and attitude and, and killer players. So we had them open up or be the main support and it was so different from what we do but it just somehow mixes in, you know? Um, then we did a tour with Kikagaku Moyo before that. And those guys, you know, they have their mellow Japanese kind of vibe going on. And, and, um, yeah, it was, we just like to pick, you know, if it's, if it's a garage band that we like, 
you know, we'll, we'll go for it. We, we're, we don't really try to do things that just, you know, the typical sort of same, all everything tuned down to like Z and <laughs> playing through like yeah. orange amps, you know, all night long type of thing. It's like, yeah, it's like, we, like right. to, we like to keep it interesting. Well, and that's, you know, it's, there's something to be said for just going for that model of just yeah. having bands you like play with you yeah. i mean like, yeah the, a lot of you know melvin shellac there's a, there's a lot there's a lot of bands that do that and i think it's it's interesting because you can you can find some really really cool stuff that way that you know, sure. would. i mean i remember when melvin's brought out like little butcherettes i was like oh man christ this band's awesome and what's funny is i didn't even realize i had seen them but i only saw like the last 30 seconds of the last song when they played with the queens of the stone age uh-huh. and i was like oh i gotta remember to check that band out and i didn't and yeah <laughs> <laughs> but years later they, they played with melvin's and i was like oh fuck it's that band that's awesome and then dale's like yeah they're they're really cool we, they're on the entire tour i'm like oh rad okay and then i like got all the records and i made up for it later. yeah but that's cool uh yeah yeah so i mean th- there's something to be said for that and and ultimately i mean there's a lot of bands in that genre that really do what you guys do sleep i guess i mean they're coming from a different place but it kind of hits folks similar in the way it's kind of hypnotic, you know, like, yeah. but, it, but it's, it's coming from like a way different place, but then yeah, they're all the sleep junior bands and, uh, right. Exactly. It's like, no one can do what sleep does. Yeah. They can, they can try and they can, they can play the same wrist. They could do covers all day long, but you just can't do it how they do it. It's you know, it's same. a, yeah. it's a, it's a feel thing, you know? And, um, it's just the way it's also in the way people play. It's like, you can't, I mean, you could cover black Sabbath all day long. It's like, <laughs> yeah, we get it. <laughs> <laughs> we have those records too. <laughs> and that's cool. And, and earthless tried to do that too. We try to do Led Zeppelin and black Sabbath. Yeah, I was going to say, that's how you guys started, right? <laughs> <laughs> and we, we came up with earthless in the middle of that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, no, it was communication breakdown. And then we went into a jam from the lead where it's in communication breakdown where Jimmy Page goes into the lead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and then I changed the drum beat into this different pace that went into like Paranoid Iron Man or something like that. And somehow we fell into like Iron Man after 30 minutes of doing just what Earthless jams like. And then we came into Iron Man to end it. And that was like how we fucking, that was our first practice, man. That was our first jam. We were like, whoa, that was pretty fun. Yeah. So well, and, and the vibe that you guys throw down is somewhat similar to that too. Like it's yeah. it's, it's got that. But I'm I'm gonna say it. I've never said it before. So I'm like, so thank you, Led Zeppelin, and thank you, Black Sabbath. <laughs> 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 and not in the ways that people normally would say that. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> so uh, and I, I want to. Uh, I'm so glad that we were able to do this and that uh, you were uh, able to to spend so much time with me. I know that's. Yeah, you know, it's pandemic life, but you got you got other things going on. You have other obligations, and I, and I really appreciate that. Likewise, man. Thank you. The one thing uh, that I've been doing lately that I, I'm, I'm going to do two more things. First of which, and this just went well on, on, a, on a recent episode. I'm going to throw it to you because you played in so many bands. But can you give me an example of? What would be like the worst shows or most memorable show that you played, and one of the best shows that you've ever played? And this could be <clears throat> any band, all up and down the line. You can do multiple bands. It's it's your call, but uh, it's usually more fun to start with the worst and then go to the best. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, there's probably been a handful of worst shows, but probably the most embarrassing worst show for me personally was okay when rocket from the crypt got back together um to do some shows it was towards the beginning run of of these festivals that were offering us to play these cool things and stuff like that yeah we played rocket was playing right before iggy and the students in in long beach i think it was in long beach yeah 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 yeah. okay yeah i remember that show yeah yeah exactly i remember that it happened i was like well Yeah, yeah, me too. Exactly. Fuck yeah. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Everything great. And okay, you get okay. Festivals are really strict, and like you get one hour to play, or you get forty minutes to play, or you get forty-seven minutes to play. 
and you got to be on time and you have to start on time and you need to end on time. (laughs) And, uh, someone in the band at the time was still needing to warm up and still do things. And, you know, no matter what, we're like, Hey, we got to go, you know, we got to go, you know, we want to get so many minutes to play. Yeah. I'm not ready yet. I'm not ready. I'm not ready again, whatever. So we ended, we ended up going on stage like 10 minutes late, maybe, you know, but you're still trying to pump out 20 songs in the set list. <laughs> right. And, and literally like, like right in the, in the halfway point of the, of one of the last songs or whatever. It's like, I think it was like Iggy's manager just came up and unplugged the chords in in the heads of the guitars. Whoa. <laughs> and and it just went from this like sound to like nothing. Oh no. <laughs> and it was just like oh man, like is this really like my memory of like opening up for like playing right before the Stooges? <laughs> yeah. Oh man. <laughs> so that's a, that's so uh, for, what they call a So for joke. me that that yeah, that's kind of like a definite wah, wah, wah. <laughs> <laughs> So Oh man. Thank God it was like a backline kit and like everything was yeah, just like that, that, that like potentially could damage the heads. There's all kinds of like <laughs> Well, no, not <laughs> more importantly, I just get the fuck out of there without oh, having yeah, like so you just get get out of Dodge too. Yeah, good thing. Yeah, I don't have to like stand and like take my symbols off and still be in like the public view, you know? Like yeah, oh, spin, look at your, that spin the wing nut off so you get the symbol. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> just like, hey guys. Yeah. How's your day? I was like I was like Vroom. I think Goldfinger's playing too. They're over there. <laughs> Oh man! Finger, where I pull that out of? Jesus! But I remember, I, like, I totally saw Iggy's manager or his like guard or whatever, you know, his state, I don't know, security guard, or whatever. He came up and I, I could see him. He was just like standing by the side of the stage, and you know, like the last like twenty minutes, just like kind of like lurking. tapping his feet. Yeah, yeah, just like making sure like we were on time. And like, sure enough, you know, not even like a minute after like we were overboard, he just came and unplugged the amps. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what i mean like hey like what i can't fucking blame him it's like yeah. we were the ones that were late it's like yeah yeah or, or you know so-and-so was named was late yeah <laughs> the band as an entity was late yeah but you you can switch to passive voice when you talk about something yeah. like that you don't want to ascribe blame you just use passive yeah. voice instead mistakes but, were made but there you go that's that's my worst so tell me about one of the best then Ah uh, man um well, I'm gonna I'm gonna take it back to uh, 2008 Roadburn, and say that uh, just that whole experience as a whole was for me ended up being the best because I was only expecting to play the Bat Cave, a little small tiny 250 capacity club right. in the bottom of Tilburg, Netherlands, and then we ended up getting catapulted to 2,500 screaming, weeded out psychedelic mushroom faded fools just you know loving the show so that was like you know you expect to play to 200 people and then you play to 2000 people and they love it what better high is there than that yeah that's that that sounds pretty good man <laughs> that was fucking awesome and we and we got a fucking double live record out of it that yeah it's fucking amazing a really like, good one yeah <laughs> and a, and the and the and the cover picture i thought was cool like that was totally like i found this guy that on Facebook that was like at the show and he like posted that picture of the cover or what would soon become the cover. Yeah. And I, and I had I, the only lead I had was that his name was Moose. I'm like, okay, how am I going to fucking find this guy? Like <laughs> his, his name is Looking Moose. For a dude named Moose. <laughs> <laughs> so it took An me Archie like two comics character. Jesus. <laughs> It took me like two months to find him, and he lives in Ireland. Could or something be an like actual that. moose for all we know. And he was so fucking cool. He like was so stoked to like give the picture to us, and you know what I mean, like nice. and do the cover. And it, it's just it was a cool experience. So so that was like probably one of the best shows. Well, that's awesome. <clears throat> and then I, I as I was heard you say, I was like, oh yeah, I think I know what the best show is going to be because that sounds like the best show ever. Period. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So then, last thing, and, and it's I, I ask this to everyone is just uh, why do you do what you do? Um, <laughs> I don't know. I was just I think I was just born this way. I was just meant meant to fucking play drums and skate and 
I don't know. It's just what I feel. <laughs> That's as good as answer as any, man. Yeah. Mario? It, feel, it feels right. <laughs> it feels, feels good. It feels good. Do yeah. it. If it doesn't, stop. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, man. It's it's been great talking to you. I'm glad we glad we finally got to do it. And yeah, thank you, Conan. Yeah, um, I don't know, boy. I was gonna say uh, this is where normally we would mention upcoming tours and stuff like that, but nope. So uh, I guess right. <laughs> stay safe, man. Likewise. <laughs> All right, brother. All right, thank you. Take care. You too. Bye. Oh, there he goes. Let's listen. Let's listen to a tune. Uh, let's listen to another Earthless tune. We got the time. It's like the middle of the night. <laughs>
this thing on. Cool. Can you hear me now? Oh, well, there you go. That's Mario Rubicaba and uh, Earthless. And that was another abrupt outro on my part. <laughs> what can I say? It's, it's late. It's late. I don't normally do this show at 2 a.m. I don't know. I can kind of get behind it, though. It's pretty cool. I thought it was good. Is this thing on? What a cool guy. Uh, Christ, that guy's like six degrees of uh, Rubicaba. <laughs> He's probably heard that before, I'm sure. Awesome, dude. Well, folks, thanks for listening. Thanks for listening to another episode of Protonic Reversal. That's the name of the show. This has been episode 170. Conan, your time Protonic Reversal. Aaron, everybody don't know. Signing off. Mr. and Mrs. America. And all the ships at sea. Traditionally Aryan Thursdays, 8 p.m. Eastern. Within the sound of my voice. 7 Central, 6 Mountain, 5 Pacific. Much later tonight is a special stay-at-home edition. RadioNeutron.com for the archives. 50,000 watts of power. No ads, no sponsors. No kidding. Patreon.com slash Protonic Reversal if you want to get the episodes sooner. It's a dollar a month. We'll get you there. But always free other than that. This microphone turns sound into electricity. Thanks for everyone who's been sharing the show around. And Can you hear me now? thanks for listening. <laughs> Out on Route 128, the dark and lonely. Stay safe. I got my radio on. Check it out. to my top 10. I'd like to thank our sponsor. But we haven't got a sponsor. Not if you were the last man on earth. She was prepared to prove it. This one goes out to a special girl. There is no special girl! It's the... It's the end of radio! The last announcer plays the last record! The last what? Leaves the transmitter! Circles the globe in search of a listener. Can you hear me now?
isn't really broadcasting if there's no one there to receive. It's the end of radio. As we come to the close of our broadcast day. Can you hear?